We're living in a time when people are very suspicious of authority because they see authority as control. And because doing what you want is seen in our society as being the greatest and most desirable good thing. But this pattern of thinking takes no account of the fact that human nature is very often its own worst enemy, making self-serving decisions that don't turn out to be in our own best interests, and they're often based on only a partial understanding of our situation. Make no mistake, that is no argument for abusive parenting, husbanding or wifing, nor authoritarian government. It's in fact for freedom that Christ has set us free, but a free world is not the same as a world where everyone does what they feel like, or a world that has no authority, no clarity, no overriding true truth in it. And if you have a problem with authority, and since the Garden of Eden onwards, humanity has had a problem with authority, then John's establishing his right to speak authoritatively in 1 John is going to be a battle he needs initially to fight with you and with me. We're going to need to concede and acknowledge that he is in a position to speak authoritatively because his case is compelling. But he's going to have to set his case out for us first. Now, he is going to be engaged in sorting out some problems with our human nature in 1 John. And that's the work God needs to do for the people that received this book in the first place and to do for us and in us to sort us out so that we can live in fellowship with God once again, just the way humanity was made to do in the garden before the issues of snakes and apples cropped up. It's what we were created for. It's where we find peace and fulfilment and joy. And it's the work God has to do in us, through his servants like John, for example, to restore our fellowship with him and with one another, so that all our joy may be made complete. And given how things currently stand then, to achieve this really useful, really worthwhile purpose, John first needs to persuade us that he has the authority to speak to us in the way that we need. And he's going to point out to us some really great things along the way as he does so. So John starts then by telling us what he's about. He says, look, I'm doing this. Full disclosure is what we've got here. And full disclosure ought to build trust. And he does this in a really powerful, moving and impassioned way. Here's what he's going to say with an explanatory bit from verse 2 in brackets in the middle, dropped out for the time being. That which was from the beginning, he says, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And that's 1 John 1, verses 1 to 4. It's a strange old sentence in the original, because there's no verb until well into it, way down in verse 2, which emphasises heavily what we proclaim, and that we proclaim. Anyway, look, let's just start there with John's heavily emphasised statement of what he is both here and also habitually all about. What we do, he says. This is what we do. That which was from the beginning is what John first runs past his reader's eyes. He's taking his claim to the authority that is born of authenticity. This, John says, is what defines our activity as eyewitnesses and heralds of the word, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That's what we're talking about, says John, in his first verse. What beginning? That which was from the beginning. What beginning is he talking about? We're working on the basis of the significant linguistic and stylistic evidence, as well as the interlacing themes of John's Gospel and 1 John, that the author of John's Gospel is the same guy as the one who is writing 1 John. So we're saying, for those reasons, the guy who writes the Gospel is the guy who writes 1 John. And John's Gospel, of course, begins in very much the same way as this. In the beginning, it says, was the Word. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The way 1 John begins is so similar to the way John's Gospel begins. If we're looking at these verses in John's Gospel rather than the ones from our text for today in 1 John, I, I'd be very quick to refer you back from John's Gospel back to Genesis 1, to the beginning. In the beginning, says Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. 
The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, that's that's clearly the beginning in Genesis and it's it's the reference of John chapter 1. So what is 1 John going to be referring to? Well, there's an interesting one. You see, in John's Gospel, it's definitely clearly a reference to Genesis. But what beginning is John referring to in 1 John? It's an important question because John does this a lot. He, re he, he uses this phrase, in the beginning, eight times in what's actually rather a short book. And he goes on to use that in the beginning twice in 2 John in verses 5 and 6. He's done this already twice more in John's Gospel at the beginning there in chapter 1, and then in chapter 8, and then in chapter 15. But then in a number of those occurrences of this phrase, from the beginning, the context doesn't allow for an at the creation of the world understanding of its meaning. It's almost as if he's thinking of the Lord Jesus coming and his ministry beginning. And that beginning in 1 John creates a new era for the world all over again. Generally, it seems best to understand that term from the beginning as an authentication claim in any event as opposed to some new fly-by-night idea or person that lacks the sort of reliability that an original and authentic eyewitness or seasoned campaigner can command, John is kind of saying, it's always like this. That seems to be the intention. This is the foundational truth from the beginning. From the start of the Messiah's ministry, at least, John says, he'd witnessed it, and as such, he'd received authentic testimony and truth to pass on. It was the original truth. And he's now passing it on. But the benefit of those he passed it to would be found in holding on to the authenticity and holding on to the authentic message that was being conveyed. What we do then, says John, is to proclaim to you, that which was from the beginning, the real deal. And what's important, he's trying to say, is that the deal should be real. That authentic, original thing. That is what, verse 3, then, we proclaim. Given that the deal must be real, then this, says John, is our core activity. We proclaim the authentic deal. Now, your English translation probably has that verb translated, we proclaim, repeatedly throughout verses 1 to 4. That's because they're trying to see it as a letter and because they're trying to make sense of it, because they think you can't make sense of John's powerful rhetoric in English the way those clever Greeks could. But this is Wales. So I reckon we can cope with this. All the stuff John deals it details in verse 1. We proclaim, he says, in verses 2 and 3. The verb is apangelo. It means to bring tidings from a person or a thing. To bring word, to bring report, to proclaim, to make known, to openly declare. It's a verb that occurs in the Bible 44 times. And it's all about bringing news, being a messenger, to tell, to announce, to bring news, to be a messenger. Now those... 44 uses of the word in the New Testament, some are really quite an ordinary telling. Some are even tellings by unbelievers. So the word is not uniquely used of gospel proclamation, but it is used of conveying important information. It's, it's a word used of conveying information of definite propositional, verbally communicated content. And it does, according to the context, get pressed into service to convey a direct, definite verbal communication of urgent and or significant gospel truth in a gospel context. As believers, the apostolic band were not always about pulpits and auditoria and loud bands and big lights. It's communication. But one jo what John says he's about, and, and you can see the other apostles and early church leaders being about this too, is the announcement of propositional truth. Stuff that's got propositions, like facts in it. And to do that as their primary outreach and discipleship strategy, whatever the context they did this in, whether it was in a pulpit or in a marketplace or wherever else. Now, the point is this. They're getting the truth across. People do not become Christians because we are nice guys. But because we're honest about not being. 
And because we announce or proclaim to people not simply this true truth about ourselves, we're not nice guys, and this truth about the God-made man who died for our sins on the cross, but that he was raised to life for our justification at the bar of heaven. It's a proclamation of truth. Truth about ourselves, truth about God himself and what Jesus has done. Now, there's something else you need to be careful to notice here that you could easily miss, that this proclamation does. And what this proclamation does, this habitual way of acting that John has got, this habitual practice, what this proclamation does is it looks people in the eye. In, in verses 2 to 3, John makes it plain. We bring this proclamation and we bring it, we do it to you. That's what we do. And we do it to you. This is clearly to you in verse 2 and even to you in verse 3. That's plain, clear, verbal communication, which characterises the passion and the activity of John's life as a servant of God. It is directed communication. So verse 2 says, the life appeared, we've seen it and testify it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life. And verse 3 says, we proclaim to you what we've seen and heard. Now, this is terribly important especially there in verse 3 actually it says we proclaim even to you what we've seen and heard very important let me give you an illustration you sometimes see a sheep dog in a field right and it's a solid dog that's full of beans running around with a great deal of busyness and a great deal of energy possibly even yapping a bit but it's not getting very far because for all the bounce and the energy the sheep aren't moving at all because they're not in a mind to go and they they don't take at all the message that the dog is trying to convey get through that gate or whatever it's going to be this is the time when you need a dog that will in a measured not damaging but deliberate no messing way get close into those sheep and first off it might give them the eye as we say fix a stare on them and advance slowly <laughs> And in certain circumstances, with a recalcitrant sort of sheep, that dog's got to be ready to go right in close and grip them without ever allowing those sheep the idea that turning away to ignore is an option. You see, in, in what one John is telling us here, focus is what the proclamation requires. And the right response to its implications is conveyed as being the only reasonable option. We look you in the eye, says John. We tell you this definite content, says John, using words, says John, that are serious, that are rational and that require action. And having said that, well, what is the content then of this real deal that you're committed to proclaiming as you look us in the eye, John? What do we proclaim, he says? We proclaim what we've seen, what we've heard and what we've touched. Whoa, this is immediate. This is real. Signs seen, explanations heard, realities made manifest so you can even touch them before their very eyes. Death, resurrection and changed lives as the Spirit gave birth to the multi-ethnic church of messianic prophecy as the time started to be fulfilled and all was made manifest. It was, it was in the light of the resurrection of Jesus, which I saw, says John, that the full extent of the messianic prophecies Prophecy, promises and prophecies was fulfilled the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures regarding his son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of david and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of god in power by his resurrection from the dead jesus christ our lord as romans 1 4 put it and john witnessed it our testimony first of all what we've seen, verse 1. First of all, said John, is what we saw. Now, John's Gospel has got a few motifs, themes running through it that sometimes get picked up by preachers and latched onto for preaching a series on John that isn't going to go through the whole 21 chapters verse by verse, right? Famously, there are seven I am statements in John's Gospel where the Lord reveals key aspects of who and what he is. But, and, and this is sometimes missed, there are also seven signs in John's Gospel too. Changing the water into wine in John chapter 2. Healing the royal official son in John chapter 4. Healing the paralytic at the pool in John chapter 5. Feeding over 5,000 people with fish and loaves in John chapter 6. Then walking on the water after that in John chapter 6. Then healing a man born blind 
showing us he's the light of the world in John chapter 9, and raising Lazarus from the dead, the pinnacle, the peak, the, the crescendo of it all, comes to this, raising Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. And, and these seven signs of the Saviour in John, they don't so much describe who he is the way the seven sayings do, but they demonstrate who he is. Interestingly, as soon as the storyline in John's Gospel has reached that peak with the resurrection and the life in the, the raising of Lazarus, the signs stop. But the sayings, the explanation carries on. The point is, the signs in John's Gospel illustrate the crucial thing or the things about who Jesus is. John then saw a lot more. He appears at the cross. He appears at the empty tomb. He's probably around for the sending of the Spirit of Pentecost and would have seen and understood that the Spirit was now empowering the early church that was now doing the works of the Messiah after the Messiah had returned to heavenly glory and sent the Spirit as prophesied in the upper room discourse in John's Gospel. John has seen big style. That's the point I'm trying to make. And he's now telling them about it. <laughs> he's now proclaiming it to them. The reality that I've witnessed these things happening. But it's not just having witnessed these things happening, as verse 2 says. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. There's two references there to sight. And the translation I've read to you differentiates. It says the life was made manifest and we have seen it. It makes a bit more sense because when you first stumble across those two references to the sense of sight in one verse, you might just wonder why is he repeating himself? What's going on? But the first verb for seeing there is one that clearly refers to seeing with your own eyes. Whereas the second one can also be used of something that is above and beyond what you merely see with your eye. This this suggests the author is referring that second time to seeing the true significance of the phenomena. We use language like that as well, don't you? When, when you've seen something, but now you see what's going on. <laughs> the true significance of the phenomena observed. Seeing behind the signs to grasp what was signified. It's as if John's referring not just to what was seen with the eyes, but also the significance of what was seen. Now... You and I can relate to this, I'm sure. We know that if a room is full of people and that room of full of people sees a miracle, only some of those folks actually come to believe to see the significance of it. It's the ones that come to believe. They, they're the ones that have seen the sign and its significance. And that's how every other time this verb is used in John's Gospel in these three shorter books that come behind it as well. The spiritual truth of the gospel, you see, is not just the doctrines and not just the facts of Jesus' person and miracles and giving assent to the fact that he's done it. The spiritual truth of the gospel only comes to roost when the significance of Jesus' teaching, his miracles, his life, his death, his resurrection, is got hold of. There's a difference then between being an observer and a seeing person. It's what our eyes have shown us and our minds have interpreted and recognised accordingly, says John. And that seeing with significance arises very definitely in John's Gospel, alongside the hearing of the teaching that informs it. So, there, says John, is what we proclaim, what we've seen, our testimony. And then, he says, our teaching, what we've heard. We've seen, we've heard. Having seen the phenomena and their significance depends, you know, to a large extent for these guys on the background of Old Testament teaching. And it's New Testament unpacking and explaining of that. As well as on the new revelation from God that Jesus' ministry brought. Jesus' miracles didn't happen in a vacuum. They fulfilled Old Testament teaching. What they'd heard over many years before they met with Jesus in this way. Now, it's our teaching, it's what we've heard. Again, the idea of verbal proclamation and announcement crops up. The message has to be heard for faith to be born, or so it appears. By one means it has to be heard or another. We do have to grasp that the hearing may be through the ears or through the eyes, as the written word conveys the message of a voice written down. But still, there's that personal verbal communication that must needs take place. And John says, we have heard. In short... You can't work it out for yourself. 
you definitely need to be told. There's this thing called natural religion. You know, people see the stars in the sky and the birds in the trees and they come to the conclusion there must be a God. It can certainly make you hunger for and long after God. There are definitely things you can learn from creation and to some extent maybe even from thinking deeply about the way things are with the world. Romans 1, 18 to 20 alludes to that. But then Paul goes on in Romans 10 verses 14 and 15 and he says, look, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed and who and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? <laughs> you need the preacher, says Paul. He's not just saying that because he's a preacher. He's saying it because that's the way it is. However much this might be at odds with the spirit of our age, of any age, people need telling or they're not going to get it. And we also were told, says John, we were told. Here's the thing. John got it from Jesus. He got his teaching from as reliable a source as you can get. So these guys who are dividing the churches John writes to really ought to listen up when John is now passing it on. We've heard, and therefore we can speak, is what John is saying. But there's one more crucial issue that John is about to highlight. We've seen, we've heard, that's our teaching. But there's also our experience. What we have actually touched, says John in verse 1. What we've seen, what we've heard, and now also he's saying what we have touched. That forms the basis for the authority with which we speak. John's highlighting the tangible reality of all he bears witness to in order to authenticate and authorise what he's teaching. To touch here is pselafao, to touch, to handle. It's not a common word. I had to look it up. It occurs in the Bible just four times. I thought immediately, of course, of the incident where Thomas, absent the first time the resurrected Lord appeared, declared that unless he touched the Lord's hands and feet and felt the nail holes and the spear hole, he wouldn't believe. Well, of course, we know the story. Thomas does finally see the Lord about a week later. Resurrected Lord, so there was a happy ending. But the point is that the standard proof and authentication of the claims of Christ arose in that incident from the opportunity, apparently not taken up in the event, as it turned out, to touch and see the reality of the, the faith that Christ was raised from the dead. To touch. Now, I did say it was a rare word, and frustratingly, perhaps, the word used for touch is not the same word as the word used in the Thomas incident. I did say it was a rare word here in 1 John. But this word is used in Hebrews 12, 18 with reference to Mount Sinai back in the Old Testament at the giving of the law to Moses when God revealed himself with such plain manifestations back there on Sinai that they could be felt or touched. John is claiming the authority he needs to teach them on the basis that he's been so close to the Lord and to his word being given and his signs that John could, as it were, reach out and touch the truths that he now holds out to them and upholds amongst them. And then in verse 2, John, as a rhetorical device, having established that what he's telling them is what he's seen and heard and touched, is as real as that, it's as authentic as that, it's that which was from the beginning, as authentic as that. Once he's done that, John uses that rhetorical device that we referred to last time. He amplifies. Do you remember that word from last week? He says all those things in verse 1. You can get hold of them and you can lay, lay hold of them and get a grip of them. And by the way, then, he says in verse 2, and he goes off on a, on a tangent. He goes up and he says, by the way, this is how that all came about. Concerning the word of life, the things we've seen and heard and touched concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we've seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. He's gone and amplified. He's gone off on one. He's going to come back. It's okay. But he's gone off on one for the moment. Life. That which concerns the word of life. Made manifest. We've seen. We testify. We proclaim the eternal life. It was with the Father. It's made manifest to us. Life's a big theme, you know, in John's gospel. And it's about to become one as we read 1 John. John's major concern here is to proclaim authoritatively what he knew about the word of life to his readers and, and hearers. And we should be interested because what's as precious to us as life itself? Oh, just as in John's gospel. John loves to spark thought using phrases that could mean a couple of things. What is this word of life? It, it could be a reference to the Lord Jesus himself. 
as the living word of God, as in the beginning of John's Gospel. Or it could be a reference to the message of life or the message that gives life, the word of life in that sense, which is all about Jesus and what's proclaimed about him. Well, which is it? Well, yes, probably all of it. <laughs> John does this. He has his cake and eats it with double meanings. John uses being vague to expand our thoughts and our understanding. Say, go think about it. That's what he seems to be saying. But just before you do go and think about it, let's be clear what this is all for. This is what we do. This is our settled method. This is how we proceed, says John. Now I've got to come to the point why we do it. We do it, says John, in verse three, so that fellowship happens. What? What's he talking about? He's got a problem with errors and divisive people in a church. Well, here's how he goes. This is important. This proclamation, that which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Now, look. That fellowship which John seeks to re-establish in these divided churches that he's addressing by proclaiming the essential gospel truth that will follow, it has two dimensions. It's a two-dimensional objective which the preaching of the gospel produces as standard. Fellowship is established with us by this means in verse 3. That which we've seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. The key to understanding what's going on is, is, the, is the purpose clause. The authenticated gospel is what creates fellowship with God's authenticated people. This is how fellowship is established with us, John's saying. Right there in verse 3. We proclaim, we do this, so that you might have fellowship with us. Period. Full stop. That's what creates fellowship with God's authentic people his authentic gospel that's it period full stop not ecumenical initiatives those don't create unity not church political maneuvering within the structures of church where the gospel has been lost or even compromised not that because of the very gospel they've lost which is what produces unity and fellowship in scripture in one john in one john three and everywhere else there's no acceptance here of the idea that a church might be a good boat to fish in rather than the boat to fish from because people don't believe what they should should believe. It, it, it's not all these artifices of human imagining, not those things that create unity, but proclaiming essential gospel truth. That's what rallies those whom God then unites by his spirit. That's what one John is showing us. That is what creates the unity that God is restoring in his broken and fallen creation. And that's how we struggle to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And, and John now goes on to spell that out. It's because of verse three, fellowship established first with God creates this fellowship through the preaching of the gospel. Establishing fellowship with God through the preaching of the gospel creates this fellowship and unity with one another. We proclaim this to you so that you might have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship was with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. See, that's where your fellowship starts and finishes. It begins with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And that creates fellowship with us amongst human beings. Why are you doing this authentic gospel proclamation thing then, John, when the church is already divided? So that the eternal plan and purpose of God in Christ is fulfilled. As sin is atoned for. And the fall is turned back in order that the fellowship God longs for both with his people and amongst his people should be created. That's the first reason. We proclaim this gospel so that that may happen. So that the eternal plan and purpose of God in Christ is fulfilled. As sin is atoned for, the fall is turned back. And people having restored fellowship with the Father and with his Son and being changed by all of that, brought together to him, are brought together in fellowship with one another. Why are you doing this authentic gospel proclamation thing then, John? To bring God and his people together with him and with one another. That's why I'm doing it. And there's a second reason, he says, before you go, the second reason is that so joy happens. 
Now, now the pagan world around John's churches, they lived for pleasure, which it called happiness. And it's the same for us today. The pagan world around us lives for pleasure and it calls it happiness. But what John is aiming at for himself, for these people, and for heaven itself, is joy. Fellowship with the Father, fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, so that joy happens. Verse 4. We maintain this focus, this passion, this preoccupation with the proclamation of the true authentic gospel. Secondly, says John, so that joy happens. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete, all of us. Right, here's the conclusion. Unity in scripture, regaining it and recreating it after the division and disunity brought about by the fall. You know, the disunity that says the woman gave it to me and I ate it. That disunity and dealing with it is brought about by proclaiming the truth, which John reassures the divided people in these verses that he has himself in reality seen, heard and touched. It's the real deal. You proclaim the real deal as the real deal and God brings his people to himself, that he's calling to himself. And that creates unity with him and then with one another. Now, unity is really important. Because as John recorded in his gospel, it was the Lord Jesus' high priestly prayer when the hour had finally come in, in John 17. Actually, it recurs in, in three verses in John 17 in quick succession. John 17, 11, 21 and 22. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And then verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. Unity, that they may all be one, just as God the Father and God the Son are one, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. How crucial is that? And then verse 22, Jesus is praying still. The glory that you've given me are given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you love me. Paul picks up the point. This is not just a, a John's gospel or a, a one John thing. Paul picks up the point and points out in Ephesus, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, this is in itself the goal of the eternal plan and purpose of God in Christ, to bring all together again under the headship of Christ. Well, if that's the case, if unity is what God wants, why didn't John just say to these believers in the house churches he was leading around Ephesus who were all falling out and getting fractious, Look, guys, not the way, just play nice. We're all different, you know, and let's just agree to disagree. And why not do that? Because Christian unity is not achieved in Scripture by accommodation. But as John has been showing us, by proclamation of accredited truth on these big issues, not by accommodating heretical opinions within the body of God's church. And that's what was starting to happen in the churches that one John is addressed to. See, the process of bringing this unity that God desires, the process of bringing it about is described in what looks almost like an aside in the middle of that high priestly prayer, in the midst of all this praying for unity we've been alluding to there in John 17, where Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. There, Jesus seems to recognise and state before us very plainly. There is the resolution of the problem of disunity. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth, which 1 John has just been referring to as the word of life. So when these churches, when churches are divided, John, in a powerful and a highly motivational way, establishes his credentials to present them, not with a peace plan he's cobbled up, but with God's peace plan for humanity in the word of the gospel, in the word of life. And when unity is threatened, John and scripture as a whole calls his people back to that. That which was from the beginning. That which we've seen. That which we've heard. That which we've touched. This we proclaim.
concerning the word of life.